Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the fourth Sunday in Advent, not the children's Christmas program. Our uh, set, though, is up here, as you can tell. The altar is uh, back against the wall, and we have the stable for the late service. So we'll just kind of worship around it like a Protestant church without an altar. Uh, I know it's unusual for us as, uh, as Lutherans. Nevertheless, we're going to use our usual service during the Advent season, the common service, which starts on page 15. And uh, we'll follow it, and it calls for beginning with a hymn. And the scripture lessons today, uh, especially though the, the Old Testament lesson that Victor will preach on, uh, makes us talk and think about Bethlehem. So appropriately, we'll start with hymn number 50, Once in Royal David City. Say good morning to someone, and we'll get started. Thanks for coming. God bless your worship. Please stand and turn to page 15. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us 
and has given his only son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Glory. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Stir up your power, O Lord, and come. Take away the burden of our sins and make us ready for the celebration of your birth, that we may receive you in joy and serve you always. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. This morning's first lesson is Micah chapter 5, starting with verse 2 and stopping in the middle of verse 5. This is a prophecy that predicted the birthplace of Jesus some 700 years before he was born. As I mentioned earlier, it will also be the sermon text for today. Micah writes, But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Therefore Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor bears a son, and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will live securely. For then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth, and he will be our peace. This is God's word. The second lesson this morning is Hebrews 10, 5 through 10. The second lesson stresses the sacrificial purpose of the body of Christ. We read Hebrews 10, 5 to 10. And I'm not going to repeat myself, even though it's going to sound like it. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but with a but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased. Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. First he said, Sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings, you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, though they were offered in accordance with the law. 
Then he said, here I am. I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second. And by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Christ once and for all. This is the word of the Lord. We sing, stand to sing now of you. The Holy Gospel for the fourth Sunday in Advent is found in the Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 1, beginning with the 39th verse. Glory be to you, O Lord. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Let's confess together the words of the Nicene Creed. They start toward the bottom of page 18. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. We're now going to sing the hymn of the day, O Little Town of Bethlehem, and that's hymn number 65.
text for today is from Micah chapter 5. Let's begin with prayer. Dear Lord, help us to focus on you. Let us put away all our worries and, and the Christmas rush and help us focus on your word. Help us to understand why Bethlehem is much more than just a location. Amen. Well, we just sang A Little Town of Bethlehem. And if you haven't heard that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, then I just told you. So why, why are we still talking about it? What's the big deal? We know, we know he's been born there. Well, I think there's actually quite a bit more to be said. And what's probably more important than what I think is that I think Micah the prophet would agree with me. You see, because Micah's prophecy about Bethlehem, which is our text today, would have meant everything for him and the people of his time. And so, for Micah and for us, Bethlehem isn't just the location of the Messiah's birth. It's, it's really the key to understanding the implications of Christ's advent. You know, Bethlehem's story, we often think of it as beginning with Jesus' birth. But really, the, the full story begins over a thousand years before Jesus would ever be born. In those days, there was a prophet named Samuel. And one day, Samuel started journeying south from his home in Ramah towards Jerusalem, and he had with him a ram's horn filled with oil. And as he walked, he couldn't help but remember a day long ago when he had also been traveling with the horn of oil. It was when he was going to anoint Saul as the first king of Israel. He remembers Saul was, was so young then. He was tall, but unassuming, even humble. But 30 years had passed now, and the young man in whom Samuel had put so much hope was, was long gone. The rebellious and prideful King Saul, who now reigned, had been rejected by the Lord. And Samuel knew that this horn of oil that he carried was going to be poured out on God's choice for Saul's replacement. As he continued to walk, he passed Jerusalem, and it must have been quite surprising to him that the new king wouldn't be found in that great city of thousands. But the Lord had told him that one of the sons of Jesse would be the new king. And so Samuel traveled farther until he came to the small village of Bethlehem. Once there, he asked for Jesse and his sons, and, and Jesse was very honored to have a great prophet visit and ask for him specifically. And so he gathered his sons and, and met Samuel. And when they arrived, Samuel began to look at each son very carefully. And he noticed that the oldest son, Eliab, was quite tall and strong. And Samuel thought to himself, surely this is the Lord's anointed. But the word of the Lord came to Samuel in that moment, and the Lord said, Do not consider his appearance or his height. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Well, one by one, seven sons of Jesse all passed in front of Samuel, and none of them were chosen. Finally, Samuel said to Jesse, Is this all the sons you have? Jesse said, There is one more. There's one more, but he is the youngest, and he is at home tending the sheep. And so Samuel called for him. And when the small boy came in, the Lord said, This is the one. And Samuel anointed David, the small shepherd of Bethlehem, as king over all of Israel. Well, David would grow up to be a great king. And throughout all his, his triumphs and his failures, he never lost his faith in God. And Israel, as a nation, stayed faithful to the Lord while he was reigning. But some 300 years later, the kings grew wicked. They no longer worshipped the Lord, and the kingdom split into two. Samaria in the north and Jerusalem in the south were the capitals. The country at this time was kind of like, like France before the Revolution, where Paris had all the wealth 
and the provinces were despised and oppressed to feed the, the luxuries and whims of the rich. This is when Micah was born. This is when Micah lived as a prophet. About the same time as Isaiah. Isaiah was, if you think about it, more of the prophet of the cities, especially Jerusalem. But Micah was the prophet to those small villages in the countryside of Judea. And so Micah and his people were victims of the city's greed. Micah also had the word of the Lord come to him. And the Lord told him that Assyria was going to come down and take over Samaria and exile the people. How would you like to be the preacher of that news? Well, I know you're oppressed and hungry now, but it's going to get worse. That's the message he had to preach. But then we get to chapter 5. And Micah realized that he did have some good news that he could preach to the people. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth. That is good news. The thought of the prophet is this. Even though Israel was soon to be deported and exiled, one day God would restore the kingdom by a return to its original starting point, the ancestral house and home of David. Bethlehem, the small village which had already given birth to one king, would give birth to another king of the same type. Although this future ruler wouldn't be exactly the same as David. No, his origins were from of old, from ancient times. Literally in the Hebrew, it means from the days of eternity. The Messiah, God's son, was coming to Bethlehem. Can you imagine what this would have meant for Micah and for the people of those small villages? To know that that future ruler wasn't going to be another domineering king, but a strong, but a strong and gentle shepherd? It must have meant so much to this rural prophet and those small villages that God was going to pass by the pomp and pride of the city and bring out his king from a small seemingly insignificant place like Bethlehem. And Bethlehem was quite small. I mean, David was born there, but nothing happened after. It never grew to become anything. It was still just some small, obscure Jewish village. 300 years later, Micah wrote, even though you are small among the clans of Judah. And even after they come back from the captivity in Nehemiah 11, he lists the cities of Judah of Judah, but he doesn't even name Bethlehem. It's just not big enough to note. And it didn't really seem destined for any more notable spot in history until Jesus' birth. Even, even Mary and Joseph testify to its insignificance. Think about it. They were from the line of David. They could trace their lineage back to David through, through a line of kings. And yet it didn't do anything for them, and they didn't really expect it to. When they came to Bethlehem, no one cared that they were from the line of David. They stayed in the stable. What I'm saying is Bethlehem wasn't just physically small, but its, its only notoriety was seemingly unimportant, forgotten. And I think, I think those two reasons, both physical size and significance, those are the two things that we feel small, that, that make us feel small in our world today. As for an example, um, I was, I'm part of the SEM choir. My first year at the seminary, we uh, took a choir tour. Part of it was going to the Grand Canyon. And if you've ever been there, they have a, this practice where you, you close your eyes and you let someone lead you until you come right to the edge, you grab the railing, and then you open your eyes 
And so the whole, I guess, the majesty of the canyon hits you all at once. And I did this, and if you ever go there, let me tell you, it is effective. It just, the ground just falls away in front of you. And it is massive. It's huge. We were, we were, um, we were looking around for a while, and one of my friends spotted a group of hikers down at the bottom. It took me a while to find them because they were so small. They looked like ants, maybe even a little smaller. And I realized I was the same size, but I probably wasn't wearing a large orange backpack. If I was down there, could they even see me? I felt small. I knew I was small. And just to think that the canyon, at its, at its deepest point, at its deepest point compared to the how thick our world is, is, is like a little bit of paint chipped off of a water tower. And to think, you know, how about our, our world so tiny compared to our sun and then the other galaxies and how there's billions of these. We don't even know where the universe ends. As far as we know, it's infinite. Think about that. We can't comprehend how big God's creation is. Or if I put it a different way, we can't comprehend how small we are. But I think, I think it's not a bad thing to feel small when we look at God's creation. I think that's a, a natural reaction, a good thing. There are some people who still really think they're a big deal, but I think it's more natural to feel small when you see, when you see nature, when you see things that are so much bigger. Than but there's another way that we feel small which, which isn't preferred or designed at all. And that's when we feel small in significance. When somebody forgets about us, when someone just doesn't have time to talk to us, they have more important things to do. When somebody leaves you, these things bring a, a terrible feeling of insignificance. Maybe you feel too young, like no one takes you seriously. Or you feel like you're old enough that you've said things so many times that no one's going to take it to heart anymore. Maybe you've worked so hard and you just want someone to notice, someone to say thank you, someone to appreciate it, but no one does. It's easy to feel small. And in those times, we wonder, can God really care about me? Does the ruler of the universe really care about me, this one person out of the 7.5 billion on this tiny speck of his creation? How could he? It's easy to think of God as just some ruler, you know, far away up on a throne who might care about the whole universe, but he could never zoom in, come down and, and care about one person or invest his time in me. The fact is that our human experience, you know, based on the expectations we have, tell us that God is just too big and we're too small. Based on human experience, we would naturally think that God just doesn't have time to deal with us individually. And why would he? Because he's too important, he's too big, and we're just too small. But then we hear this prophecy from Micah, that God came to Bethlehem. And that was... That was always contrary to human expectations or ideas. Samuel was surprised when he had to pass by the big city and come to little Bethlehem to anoint the son of Jesse. And he was probably even more surprised when the bigger, older brothers were rejected and the small boy was chosen. Micah and his people must have been overjoyed, but they were probably surprised too that God wouldn't bring his king from one of the capitals or Jerusalem with his temple. Why, even the wise men who came from the east, where did they come? To Jerusalem, naturally expecting the king to be found in a great city. But they didn't find him there. The star led them to Bethlehem. And perhaps, most surprisingly enough, God also comes to you. No matter how small or insignificant you feel, God loves to come to small places 
He loves to dwell and make his, make his living in the lives of humble people. I mean, do, is it hard to believe that God can get on your level? Is it really hard to believe that God could, could care about you personally? Remember what Micah said, a ruler for me whose origins are from of old, from, from eternity, that the God who is, who is bigger than the universe decided to link himself with time and enter into human history. And where did he come? In a stable of little Bethlehem. Yes, this tiny baby, David's son and David's Lord, knows what it means to be small. And he comes to you comes to me each day. And it's, it's not like a, an NFL player gives you an autograph or a celebrity visits your house. It's much more personal than that. As Micah stated, just like David, Jesus would come as a shepherd king. What did Jesus himself say? I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Jesus knows us in the most intimate way. He, he knows us better than we know ourselves. He loves us. Think about that. He loves us more than we love ourselves. And if you don't believe that, then Jesus also said, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Jesus laid down his life for you. And so we may be small physically, and sometimes we may feel small when people belittle us here on earth, but we are so significant in God's eyes. The only thing harder to comprehend than how big our universe is, is how big we are in God's eyes. That he would send his perfect son to die for us. And then to come to us each day. To come to us in his word, in the sacraments, in the people we love, in prayers at home. That Jesus comes to us and loves us and sees us through, that he cares about what we do each day, even the small things. He cares about some of the things that we don't even care about. You know, Bethlehem is its now under Palestinian control. It's not the nicest area to be in. But still, if, if you ask someone today what they know Bethlehem for, they'll probably say something about Jesus being born there. You know, no one knows what resources Bethlehem, if they have any, or anything about the city in and of itself. And perhaps that's the best reputation that we could want to, to only be known for our association with Jesus. That if people know you only because you're a Christian, only because you're a follower of Christ, then that is better than being the most successful, captivating person who ever lived. Because your Father in Heaven knows you only through your connection to Jesus. I bet you if someone asked you about that, they'd be pretty overjoyed and surprised to find out that God comes to them too and that He cares about them. Finally, I'd, I'd like to conclude just as Micah did. Micah wrote to a people who were going to be exiled to Assyria. And the last verse of our text today is what he wanted them to hang on to. Verse 5. And he will be our peace. So simple. Just as those Israelites would be enslaved and exiled, made to feel small in, in every sense, they could still hold out hope that that ruler would come from eternity that he would rule for eternity, under whose shepherding care they could live in peace and in security, even if their lives on earth wouldn't be peaceful. And he did come. Micah's prophecy has been fulfilled. Let him be your peace this Christmas. Look into the manger and see that your shepherd king has come even to a place as small as Bethlehem. Amen. Please stand. And that peace of God
which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We join to sing the Create in Me on page 20. seated we will offerings may now be given Let us pray. Almighty God, we praise you that from infancy you prepared prophets to proclaim your truth. Even so, we pray that you would prepare servants of the word today to preach your saving gospel with faithfulness and power. Good Lord, in love you declared us to be yours and guard us from harm in many ways. Protect the police, fire personnel, and other emergency workers whose duty and service to us has called them away from their loved ones this time of year. Keep all who travel safe during this coming week. O oh, Jesus born in Bethlehem, remind us that you care for us as a shepherd and that nothing can take us out of your grasp. As you humbled yourself to such a small birthplace, let us gladly humble ourselves for the benefit of others. Give us your heart this season and always. We pray for those who are physically, emotionally, and spiritually suffering on account of illness or grief. This morning we also pray a prayer of celebration on behalf of our sister Kim Harriet, who has received her last cancer treatment. We ask that for all of our sisters and brothers in Christ, especially for Kim, that you would continue to heal and comfort them and work your protecting power in their lives. Whatever happens to us, let your will always be done. All these things and whatever else you see that we need, grant us, O God, for the sake of Christ, who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, 
one God forever and ever. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen, amen, amen. Let's sing the last song of Advent, hymn number 23, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming out to worship. As you can figure out, the late service is the children's Christmas service. Uh, and there'll be like some 65 kids up here singing, smiling, costumed, and proclaiming Jesus' birth in a wonderful way. So sat through part of the uh, rehearsal yesterday. They've had a lot of rehearsing. They sound great. I think uh, uh, those of you that will be here for it, you'll really enjoy it. Those of you that won't, check it out online. It'll be uh, posted in the next week or so, you can see uh, 
some of the music abilities of our kids, and uh, the whole program is pretty neat. Tonight, youth group age people, eighth grade through high school, are invited to the youth group Christmas caroling and party outing. Starts at five o'clock. Come to church, right, at five, and then you will be transported to um, somewhere to carol at a nursing home, and then you'll go to uh, Ken and Leslie Ruppel's house and have a Christmas party. You need to wear your ugliest Christmas sweater or just something. Don't come without shirts. <laughs> or if your parents or anybody here ordered Christ our Savior Lutheran sweatshirts or t-shirts, they're here. There's a bag with your name on it. But not if you ordered a t-shirt and a golf shirt or a sweatshirt and a golf shirt. The golf shirts are at the UPS distribution center, <laughs> locked up for some reason somewhere, and we aren't getting them till tomorrow. So if you ordered t-shirts and sweatshirts and one golf shirt, Rosemary Winnicky has not yet put your t-shirts and, and sweatshirts in a bag. She's waiting for all the stuff to show up. So on the Welcome Center, there are white bags with names on them. So to remit whatever the cost is that you got, just uh, Put it in your offering envelope and label it on the outside of the envelope um, appropriately. And then uh, tomorrow, those shirts come. And I realize I'm one that's mailing one to Wisconsin for a present for my dad. You might want one. Put your fingers in your ears, kids. You might want one for your present. You're welcome to come in uh, You know, business hours on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I guess they won't be here tomorrow, but later in the day, Wednesday. Can't promise you Thursday, uh, but they'll be around. So you'll get your shirt. Next Thursday, this coming Thursday, we do have church at 4.30 and 6 because it's Christmas Eve. There's no 7 o'clock church on Thursday, uh, our normal weekly thing. Nor is there the following week on December 31st because of the New Year's Eve holiday. All right, I think that's all the announcements. Let Vicar and I get to the back door, shake your hands, and we'll see you Christmas Eve if you're traveling this week, and we won't see you. Uh, travel safely and come on back, and we'll see you in 2015. 16.